Hi, and welcome back. In the previous part, we saw how to use all possible parallel computing resources of a modern CPU in applications in which inner loops are only doing calculations with some small data that can be kept in registers. But most applications will also need to read some input data from the main memory. And the main memory is slow, painfully slow. For example, if you're doing something like floating point additions, we have seen that a typical 4-core CPU can do 64 single precision floating point additions per clock cycle. Each addition takes two numbers, and these numbers take four bytes each. So each clock cycle you will need to feed 64 times 2 times 4 bytes to the arithmetic units to keep them busy. And that's 512 bytes, half a kilobyte of data per clock cycle. And how much data you can get from the main memory to the CPU per clock cycle? A typical number is something as small as 10 bytes. So there is a factor of 50 difference. So if you do, for instance, lots of additions and all of your input comes from the main memory, you can only use roughly 2% of the performance of your CPU. The CPU could consume data 50 times faster than what you are giving it. Or put otherwise, if you want to get the full arithmetic performance, only 2% of the input can come from the main memory. All other operands have to come from either CPU registers or some cache memory that is closer to the CPU. In this part, we will focus on registers. In the next part, we will come back to cache memory. As we have discussed earlier, in a typical Intel CPU, there are two types of registers. There are 16 integer registers that can hold 64-bit numbers. This is enough space for something like long long in C++. And there are 16 vector registers that can hold 256-bit vectors. And this is enough space for something like 8 single precision floating point numbers. As a quick side note, all of these registers are just logical concepts. They are more physical storage elements in the hardware, but usually we don't need to directly care about them. From our perspective, the CPU has got these 16 plus 16 slots that we can use to store data so that it is immediately available. Of course, usually we don't directly reason about registers. We let the C++ compiler to figure out what to keep in registers and what to keep in the main memory. And what usually happens is that whenever you have got local variables in your code, the compiler will try to keep as many of them in registers as possible. Just keep in mind that registers aren't the same thing as memory. You can't have pointers to data in registers. If you need to have a pointer to X, then X has to remain in the memory. And you can't treat multiple registers as an array. There is no such thing as referring to register number i, where i is some value you calculated at runtime. And finally, keep in mind that we have only got 16 plus 16 registers in our CPU. Large arrays can't be kept in registers. If you're even a little bit unsure about where the compiler decided to keep your local variables, you can always have a look at the assembly code and see that there are no surprises there. So what is the general strategy here? Memory is slow, registers are fast. We want to minimize memory references. And to do that, we can try to keep as much useful data in registers as possible. Now, if your code only reads each input element once, 
there isn't really anything you can do. You have already got the smallest possible number of memory reads. Sometimes this happens. But in many programs, you will need to use the same input value many times. And whenever this happens, there is at least some potential for reducing the number of memory reads. Maybe you could redesign your program so that you read a value only once. Keep it in registers for a while and use it many times for something useful before you throw it away. Let's return to our sample application, finding the cheapest part with at most two hops. To keep things simple, let's say n is 1000. Now our input and output matrices have dimensions 1000 by 1000. So 1 million input values, 1 million output values. But if you look at a naive solution for this problem, we got three nested loops. Each runs for 1000 iterations. And inside the innermost loop, we have got two memory reads. So we have got 1 million input values, but we make 2 billion memory reads. So we read the same value 2000 times. We read a value, use it just once for one addition, and then throw it away. What a waste. If you look at memory writes, we are doing something much better. We only write 1 million values. But reading is clearly a bottleneck here. We have already very briefly discussed how to make memory reads more efficient. For example, we could organize data so that we are reading consecutive elements so that each read operation is faster. But let's focus now on the number of read operations. Could we somehow reduce the total number of memory reads? If you think about registers, you can see that we are using very few registers here for anything good. Maybe the compiler will keep n, r, d, and i, j, k in integer registers and floating point values x, y, z, and v in vector registers. But there are many more registers available. Could we somehow benefit from them? Let's think about what is happening here in a bit smaller scale. For example, to find out what is the cheapest part from node 2 to node 6, we need to check all intermediate points k. So we check the cost of going from 2 to 0 and from 0 to 6, from 2 to 1 and from 1 to 6. Stay at 2 and then from 2 to 6 from 2 to 3 and from 3 to 6, and so on. We need to eventually read the entire row 2 and the entire column 6 of the input matrix. We read n plus n elements and produce one unit of output. Let's now calculate another result, the cheapest part from node 2 to node 7. So we check from 2 to 0 and from 0 to 7, from 2 to 1 and from 1 to 7, and so on. We will again read n plus n elements, but note that we are again reading row number 2 here. Too bad we couldn't keep all these values in registers, now we will need to read them again. What about this output element, cheapest part from 3 to 6? Again, we will read n plus n elements, row 3 and column 6. And remember that we already read column 6 earlier. And to compute this value, again, we will read n plus n elements, row 3 and column 7. And remember that we already read both row 3 and column 7 earlier. Now, let's stop for a moment here. So we calculated four results. And to calculate these results, we only needed to know two rows and two columns of our input data. But if you use the naive algorithm to calculate four results, it will read four rows and four columns of the input. It will read the same rows and the same columns 
twice. So could we somehow avoid this? Let's try to interleave these four calculations somehow. We try to find in one pass what is the cheapest part from 2 to 6, the cheapest part from 2 to 7, the cheapest part from 3 to 6, and the cheapest part from 3 to 7. So how to do it? Again, we just go through all intermediate points k. Let's start with case 0. We check the cost of going from 2 to 0 and the cost of going from 3 to 0. We check the cost of going from 0 to 6 and the cost of going from 0 to 7. We only need to read these four input values and we can store them in registers. And now we can calculate all combinations 2 to 0 to 6, 2 to 0 to 7, 3 to 0 to 6, 3 to 0 to 7. We keep track of four values. The cheapest part from 2 to 6 we have seen so far, the cheapest part from 2 to 7 we have seen so far, the cheapest part from 3 to 6 we have seen so far, and the cheapest part from 3 to 7 we have seen so far. We go through all possible values of k, case 1, case 2, and so on. And we only need to read each element of rows 2 and 3 once. And we only need to read each element of columns 6 and 7 once. And we are done. We calculated four results. We needed to know two rows and two columns of input for that. And we managed to read each element only once. So we reduced the number of memory lookups by a factor of two in comparison with the naive solution. And of course, there is nothing special about these numbers 2, 3, 6, 7. We can do the same thing for any two rows and any two columns. Say, calculate parts from 4 and 5 to 0 and 1. This way, we can go through the entire result matrix in 2 by 2 blocks and compute each block efficiently, or at least with fewer memory accesses than a naive approach. And we can do even more, make the block larger, maybe keep 3 by 3 results in 9 registers. Or we can switch to vector registers and maybe keep 8 by 8 results in just 8 vector registers. This way we would already reduce memory lookups by a factor of 8. Each element that we read would be used eight times for something good. And by the way, as an interesting byproduct, what happens here is that we also automatically got some instruction level parallelism for free. Instead of accumulating only one minimum, we accumulated, say, four minimums in an interleaved manner. So now we just need to vectorize this idea then use OpenMP for multi-threading, and we are good to go. And if we implement all this and benchmark it, we will see that this is already enough in our sample application to achieve almost factor 100 speedups. And I'd like to emphasize this. We didn't make memory accesses any faster here. We rearranged code so that we have fewer memory accesses. We can push this idea even further by coming up with more clever ways to keep as much useful data in registers as possible, but we can't completely avoid memory accesses. And the cost of the memory reads still means that we don't quite manage to feed data fast enough to the CPU to keep its arithmetic units busy all the time. And it is hard to figure out how to eliminate further memory reads. Well, if you can't figure out how to have fewer memory reads, we need to figure out how to make the memory reads cheaper. And this is the topic of the next part of this lecture.